This episode is sponsored by Suzerain, a new text-based political strategy game available right now on both Mac and PC. Stay tuned after this episode for more information on how you can lead the Republic of Swordland to glory or disaster in a challenging and complex alternate world. The Republic of Swordland is even today a young nation. Its brief history has been marked by revolution, civil war, social unrest, and economic instability. It is seen as a potential puppet by the superpowers of the world, and as a possible rival, partner, or even leader by its immediate neighbors. In the new, modern world of conflicting ideologies, political uncertainty, and commercial opportunities, the future of Swordland is impossible to predict. For perhaps the first time, however, that future may lay in the hands of the swords themselves. It took over a millennia for the swords to achieve statehood. When they first fled the frigid climate of northern Makopa and traveled to the distant southern lands of that great continent, they traveled alongside the tribes of Mark, Agno, and Valk. They fought together to secure the territories they had found, but in victory, all fell under the dominion of the tribe of the Mark and their great Khan, Unga. The empire he founded was the largest and most prosperous the world had ever seen. Even the swiftest riders traveling along the Grand Imperial Highways could take months to deliver their messages, and facing the limits of their wealth and power, the Markian Empire could not endure forever. The Renan was one of many kingdoms to emerge from its eventual collapse, taking with its independence the old capital of Karakaman, now called Erlery, and much of its surrounding lands. Again, the swords lived under the aristocracy of a foreign people, in a country that was never truly theirs. The shape of the modern world began to take form in 1823 with the pivotal Century of Revolutions. Jonathan XII, King of Arcasia, was overthrown, and while the borders of that nation were far from the Renan, the aftershocks of that conflict would ripple across the world. Revolutionary spirits were felt in every nation and expressed in different ways. Within the Renan, the tenets of nationalism took root within the sword population. The aristocracy was seen as an impediment to true swordish sovereignty, and in every city and territory came voices for radical action. The revolution of 1859 resulted in the bloody extinction of the Renan dynasty, and after seven years of bloody conflict, the proclamation of the Kingdom of Swordland. The kingdom's only monarch would be King Egmund. He claimed to be of purple blood, a newly popular ethnic concept advocating swordish nationalism and pride. The old traditions and heritage of the Renan were erased from Swordland's national identity, and old aristocracy completely reformed. The most prominent of these changes was the relocation of the nation's capital, from the old heart of the Markian Empire to the city of Hull, renamed Hull Sword, or High Sword, to distinguish its new status. The early reign of King Egmund was renowned for its conquests in neighboring Wellen, Bergia, and Agnolia. While many within the conquered populations were quick to welcome the swords as liberators, their treatment varied considerably across their ethnic backgrounds. Only the Agnolians were treated as true equals and given the chance to assimilate and attain citizenship. The goodwill and popular support that King Egmund had earned through his conquests was quickly squandered. Following the wars, the king seized all of the Renan's assets and transferred them into his personal treasury. At the same time, his government ended many of the social programs instituted before he came to power. The move sparked the largest protests in Swordish history, and brought Arta S. Wissi, a leader within the Republican faction within Parliament, to national attention. Many of the cuts were reversed, and the threat of a rebellion was abated. A series of investments in infrastructure throughout the last decade of the 19th century helped invigorate the Swordish economy. Federal projects in the cities of Dare, Valgan, and Sana helped elevate them from centers of poverty to hubs of industry and commerce. They also brought to King Egmund a much-needed boost in popularity whose reputation had never fully recovered. The early 20th century saw a costly dispute and blockade by the Empire of Valgos, the world's largest sea power. 
the damage to Swordland's trade and economy was yet another blow to the king's leadership during an increasingly precarious era. At the same time, the king had failed to produce a male heir, losing the confidence of many of his traditional defenders. Moreover, while the century of revolutions had nearly run its course throughout the world, the concepts of republicanism and democracy still held sway with many in Swordland. With King Edmund's grip over the country failing in his old age, Arta S. Wissey again rose to national prominence. Wissey's Republican arguments had swayed many across the country, and even radicalized one of the most prominent advisers to the king himself. With this enormous split in the Royalist faction of Parliament, a chain of events quickly unfolded. Energized by Wissey's passionate speeches, thousands took to the streets. In an unexpected display, they were joined by elements of the Swordland First Army, and with their turn against the king, the last route through which he might have maintained power was closed. In 1923, to prevent needless bloodshed and suffering, King Edmund and the royal family were allowed to leave the country peacefully, entering into a new life of exile. This act of mercy was the initiative of Arthur S. Wissey himself, now the president of the Republic of Swordland. While the kingdom had lasted for less than half a century, the feelings of national identity created by King Edmund were embraced by the new Republican government. President Wissey's efforts were instead focused on creating the institutions necessary for a modern democracy, most notably, the National Assembly. These efforts were broadly supported within the nation, but, with the rise of a Republican government, the country was now seen as a potential prize within a growing worldwide ideological struggle. Like Swordland, both the Republic of Arcasia and the Socialist Republics of United Contana had emerged from the ruins of monarchy during the century of revolution. In the years since, however, each had embraced wildly divergent economic systems and each had acquired the status of global superpower. While Arcasia had become a proponent of unfettered capitalism, United Contana was calling for a state of permanent revolution as a means of accomplishing worldwide communism. With Swordland directly embracing neither ideology, the country had unwittingly become a proxy battleground between the two superpowers. With the rising influence of the Communist Party across Swordland ahead of the first general elections, a military coup was launched against the government of President Wissey in 1927. The elections were called off, and hundreds of suspected communists executed in the streets of Holsord over the following year. The violence provoked both the communist-leaning segments of the population and communist sympathizers in the military to take up arms, and the nation collapsed into civil war. Hundreds of thousands were killed in the Swordish Civil War, and the fighting quickly took its toll on both the nationalists and communist forces. In 1929, after two years of war, the Swordland Sixth Army, one of the last major units uncommitted to either side, took to the field under the command of Colonel Tarkin Sol. Sol embarked on a campaign against both the nationalists and communists, winning a stunning victory within the capital and pursuing the shattered armies of both sides across the countryside. The war would end that same year, and Tarkin Sol was named the second president of the Republic of Swordland. Sol himself would write a new constitution for the nation and drastically expand the powers of the presidency. Term limits were abolished, and the ability of the Supreme Court and National Assembly to overturn presidential edicts was drastically curtailed. Under Sol's leadership, the United Swordland Party became the preeminent political party within the nation and the only one to participate in the nation's first election. Despite its status as first among equals, many within the party and across the nation had become concerned by the nation's drift towards authoritarian practices. As President Sol served through five consecutive terms, a reformist faction within his own party began to call for change. In 1946, this wing had become powerful enough to publicly challenge Sol, overthrowing him as the leader of the United Swordland Party. While Sol would president throughout the remainder of his term, in 1949, the party would be represented on the ballot by Ewald Alfonso, a powerful business magnate who promised to reinvigorate Swordland's stalling economy. 
Ewald Alfonso would lead the USP to victory in the elections of 1949, but his radical free market reforms instead created a devastating recession. Combined with a worldwide economic crisis, the tenure of President Alfonso was marked by low popularity. Many of the old leadership either resigned voluntarily or were forcefully evicted from the United Swordland Party during his term, and in the lead up to 1954, the party had seemingly lost its identity. For only the second time in its history, a new name will be on the ballot representing the USP. While the United Swordland Party has become nearly synonymous with the Swordland government, the Republic itself maintains a still developing political system with the potential for drastic change. Officially a federal parliamentary republic, the president, at least in theory, serves only so long as they maintain the confidence of the Grand National Assembly. This is the sole body within the republic given the legislative prerogatives by the Swordish constitution. In practice, however, the reforms initiated by Sol mean Swordland more closely resembles a presidential republic, and the legislature can be widely sidestepped or brought under the influence of the president. A unicameral body, the National Assembly consists of 250 seats, with political parties requiring 10% of the national vote to earn a seat. Once this threshold is met, each party decides internally how to appoint the representatives to their awarded seats. Since the end of the Swordish Civil War, the National Assembly has been dominated by the United Swordland Party, which has earned a comfortable majority in every election. The People's Freedom and Justice Party, traditionally considered to be centre-left-leaning and made up mainly of the middle classes, is currently the official opposition. It has fiercely opposed the constitution written by President Sol and has seen increased support in recent years. The second largest opposition is the nationalist, ultra-conservative National Front Party. Formed in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, its initial views were considered extremist, but it has since moderated its stance to appeal to a wider base. Several other parties exist across the country, but none have achieved a sizable number of seats within the Assembly. The Grand National Assembly is intended as the true seat of governance within the nation and a balance against the powers of the presidency. Since Sol's reforms, however, it is only the Supreme Court that holds such authority. As the highest legal body for both constitutional and judicial review, it has the power to act as a second legislative body. The Supreme Court can review proposed laws in both form and substance and strike down any law thought to be in breach of the Constitution. It holds the final vote on proposed changes to the Constitution. The 11 seats of the Supreme Court are appointed by the President, but the Chief Justice is elected from within. Outside of the Supreme Court, only the military maintains the power to realistically confront the office of the President. While officially their Commander-in-Chief, the military has wielded some political influence of its own and affected change in Swordish policies. The Swordish Armed Forces are among the largest in the region, the result of compulsory military service. While a small core of professionals exist within the Armed Forces, it is conscripts that make up the vast majority of the force. Divided into three major branches, the Swordland Army, Swordland Navy, and Swordland Air Force, the military has traditionally been viewed with great prestige. As a consequence of its many armed conflicts, its leadership, at least at the highest levels, is very experienced. The lingering recession, however, has taken its toll on each branch, and their equipment is increasingly antiquated. While the National Assembly, Supreme Court, and military can be at least ostensibly divided between various official parties, the reality is often more murky and ill-defined. Unofficial factions exist within every state institution and political party. The legacy of Tarkin's soul is still very real, and the old guard from prior administrations has yet to be removed completely. To some, they are the last lingering elements of a man whose power is long gone, while others fear they are the face of a shadow regime, one last protection put in place by Sol to guard what he fought to create. The reformists are most prominently represented by the People's Freedom and Justice Party, but their message of democratic reforms has taken root well beyond their traditional ranks. The oligarchs, meanwhile, hold power of a very different kind, powerful elites whose actions during the privatization built enormous fortunes and connections with foreign enterprises. 
the great game between Arcasia and United Contana has also never wavered, and Swordland remains a prize to be won in the Cold War between the two. It is into this enormously complex environment that a new figure has risen within Swordland. The 1953 elections ended with Anton Rain, named President of Swordland, only the fourth individual in his nation's history to do so. Even in victory, he remains an unknown quantity to many across the country, and despite his campaign promises, as president, there is little constraint on his power. There remains the potential that the constitution might be reformed, and true democracy brought to the Republic for the first time since the brief reign of Arta S. Wissey. Or, he might be another Tarkin soul, tightening his grip over every institution of state. Women's rights, the treatment of minorities within the population, immigration and economic stability. These issues too have never been too far from the center of Swordish politics, and the chance again for real change might have come. The first president of Swordland was a radical idealist, ousted from the office by military coup. The second was a stern autocrat, bringing to his country stability and order at the expense of political freedom. The third was weak and ineffectual, unable to overcome the realities of his situation and achieve any real progress. The fourth remains to be seen. Thanks to Suzerain for sponsoring this investigation into the Republic of Swordland. Suzerain is a text-based political strategy game available right now on PC and Mac. Play as the newly elected president of Swordland in a turbulent era, following President Sol's 20-year dictatorship. It's 1954, and it's your job to lead the country into an uncertain future. Navigate your first term through conversations with your cabinet members, colleagues, and family. It's up to you to decide who you will trust, what sacrifices you'll make, and where your priorities lie. Will you reform the Constitution, transforming the Republic into a brutal dictatorship or a true democracy? Align yourself with the capitalist or communist superpowers? Prepare for potential military threats on the horizon? Address racial minorities, women's rights, the ongoing recession, immigration, and all the other challenges and opportunities presented to a world leader. You'll find Suzerain on Steam, Humble, or GOG right now. I got the chance to try out the demo of Suzerain, and I can heartily endorse it as both a political strategy game and as an intricate alternate world. It's rare that I've come across a country with such a detailed history, governmental structure, and so many top-notch elements of world building. Join me right after this episode goes live on twitch.tv slash Institute, where I'll be guiding the Republic into a communist utopia. Probably.